Are you ready for the word? Yes, sir. I hope uh, next Sabbath that we'll be back into the book of Enoch. But yesterday, uh, I was reading in 1 Kings 18 and 19, and uh, the passage just spoke to me and encouraged me, and I want to share it with you today and hope that uh, by it and through it that you also can be encouraged. And that passage is in 1 Kings 19. In 1 Kings 18, Elijah has had the great showdown on Mount Carmel where he taunted, embarrassed, and had the uh, 450 prophets of Baal slain. He then prayed and rain came down after that. And you'll remember he had prophesied three years before, it will not rain until I say so. And now three years later, he says so. And so it rains. But after that, the wicked queen of Israel, the wife of Ahab, what's her name? Jezebel. Jezebel. Hearing of what Elijah had done to the prophets of Baal, she swore she was going to do the same thing to Elijah. She sent word to Elijah that she was going to kill him the very next day. <coughs> so, when you get to 1 Kings 19, Elijah, who did not run from the 450 prophets of Baal but confronted them, and who did not run from Ahab but confronted him, now that same Elijah goes to a cave to hide from Jezebel. I think it tells us more about Jezebel than it does about Elijah. That woman's wickedness knew no bounds. Her meanness and cruelty and savagery were renowned. And knowing that about her, Elijah chose to go to a cave to get away from her. However, knowing that about her, however, Yahweh doesn't seem to be pleased with the choice that Elijah had made. So he confronts him beginning in verse 9 of 1 Kings 19. And Elijah came there into a cave and lodged there. And behold, the word of Yahweh came to him and said to him, What doest thou here, Elijah? What are you doing here? You understand Yahweh never asks us questions to get information? <laughs> If he asks a question, it's to get us to rethink our position. Elijah is about to give what he thinks is a good answer, and he thinks he's going to help Yahweh understand what's going on. But Yahweh does not lack understanding. Mm -hmm. He asked the question to get Elijah to rethink what was going on. He knew what Elijah thought was going on. He wants him to rethink it. So he asked Elijah the question because being in the cave was a clear indication that Elijah did not understand what was going on, nor did he understand what needed to be going on. Let's read Elijah's answer nonetheless. Verse 10. And Elijah said, I've been very jealous for Yahweh. Notice the, that phrase, very jealous for Yahweh. <clears throat> Elohim of hosts. For the children of Israel have forsaken your covenant, thrown down your altars, slain your prophets with a sword, and I, even I only, am left, and they seek my life to take it away. The phrase, very zealous, literally he said, I have been zealously zealous. Not just zealous, but zealously zealous. Extremely zealous. In the Hebrew, the word that's translated jealous there, which means zealous, the word that's translated zealous there was written two times or spoken by Elijah two times. So literally he said, I'm zealously zealous. <coughs> Extremely zealous. Now, I want you to notice what his struggle was against. Not the prophets of Baal. Not Baalism. That's not what his struggle is against. 
The prophets of Baal were not the problem. They were the symptoms of the problem. The problem was the children of Israel. They forsook the covenant. They tore down the altars. They killed the prophets. Walk in truth for any amount of time. Be zealous for Yahweh to some degree. And like Elijah, you will soon discover that your struggle is not with the unchurched. Instead, it's with all of those who regularly go to church but have forsaken Torah. And refuse to worship as Yahweh instructs, which is tearing down his altar. And they fire any preacher who dares to tell them the truth. Their sword becomes a checkbook. They slay preachers by cutting them off from their necessities. We, we, can, we can, I think, identify with what Elijah said there. The problem is those who claim to be followers of the Elohim of the Bible but forsake the Bible. Right? So Elijah said... I, even I only, am left. You ever felt like you was by yourself? True. I hear from people very often on Facebook and YouTube who rejoice that they either found our page or uh, that they found our channel because... Somewhere in their journey, they turned toward Yahweh, Yeshua, found Torah, and wanted to walk in it, but then they found themselves alone in that walk. They had no one to assemble with, no one to fellowship with, no one to worship with, no one to study Torah with, no one to encourage or no one to be encouraged by. They feel like Elijah did, alone. Well... That's the reason I wanted to look at this text this morning. It's my desire to see what's written here, to talk about what's written here, and to encourage us all with the knowledge that none of us are alone, and certainly none of us are forgotten. And to impress upon us the power of relationship. Back to our text. Elijah said that he was alone, but this is not the first time that he felt that way. He stated something similar back in chapter 18 up on Mount Carmel. He said this in uh, 1 Kings 18, 22. I, even I, only remain a prophet of Yahweh. But Baal's prophets are 450 men. So Elijah has been feeling alone for a while. But if he comes out of that cave, he's going to find out he's not by himself. There's a young man Yahweh's raising up, plying with some oxen in a field. He's just waiting for Elijah to come anoint him to be a prophet. He's just waiting to join himself to Elijah. Where he'll never be shaken loose. Not even Elijah can shake him loose. He needs Elisha and Elisha needs him. If you feel alone, know this. Yahweh, Yahweh is raising up prophets, pastors, and teachers who are going, going to exceed what you and I have done. Yeah. That's true. <clears throat> In our midst are those who have never tasted pork, Amen. never participated in Christmas, never participated in Easter, never participated in Halloween, never missed a Moedim, never considered the law to have passed away. <laughs> Yahweh is going to, do, going to do exceeding mighty things with them. Yes. Yes. They'll be zealously zealous for Yahweh and for Torah. Yes. Amen. But as I was saying, Yahweh... Is raising up 
those in our midst who are going to do exceeding abundantly above what we've done. And we need to, to find encouragement in that. We need to recognize that and equip them and not hide in a cave, but find ourselves equipping those who are going to come after us. Let's read on in 1 Kings 19. Let's go down to verse, uh, verse 11. And Yahweh said, after Elijah had given his answer, Yahweh said, go forth and stand upon the mount before Yahweh. And behold, Yahweh passed by, and a great and strong wind rent the mountains and broke in pieces the rocks before Yahweh. That's a strong wind. Ripping a mountain in two and breaking rocks into pieces. But Yahweh was not in the wind. And after the wind, an earthquake. But Yahweh was not in the earthquake. And after the earthquake, a fire. But Yahweh was not in the fire. And after the fire, a still small voice. And it was so when Elijah heard it, <coughs> he wrapped his face in his mantle and went out and stood in the entering end of the cave. And behold, there came a voice unto him and said, What are you doing here, Elijah? And we need to learn this important le lesson. Wind that can break rocks in two, earthquakes and fires are terrifying. And when those kind of things happen, they demand your attention and they are meant to control your thoughts and control your emotions and affect your decisions. But if we allow the world's chaos to cause fear, control thoughts and actions, and if we become unwilling or unable to hear the still small voice of Yahweh, then we're going to be powerless to do the things that need to be done in our day. So we have to stop focusing on the chaos and listen for Yahweh. When Elijah heard what was described here as a still, small voice, go look that up. Still means a very calm, quiet, almost silent voice. Small means one that has been crushed into thinness. So it's... It is a almost silent, very thin voice. You had to be listening real close to even know that anything was said. What did that voice say? What are you doing? Same thing that it said the first time, didn't it? Except this time we're told it was a very still, small voice. So I want you to imagine this the way the scripture is presenting it to us. A crushed, almost silent voice saying to this zealously zealous prophet, what are you doing here? Not in a loud, booming voice, but a still, small voice that said to the prophet, what are you doing here, picture this, if you will. Elijah wants Yahweh to see his situation and have pity on him. Yahweh, in a still, small voice, wants Elijah to see his situation. <clears throat> Here he is, the Elohim of all of creation, the Elohim of Israel, the Elohim who has just backed up everything Elijah has said. Elijah said it wouldn't rain until he said so, Yahweh backed it up. Elijah called for fire to come down from heaven upon a stack of wood that had been soaked with water. Elijah, excuse me, Yahweh backed him up. Now Elijah's hiding in a cave as if Yahweh's arm is too short and his ears grown deaf. Right. Elijah, Yahweh asked, what are you doing? Don't you see that even if, Yahweh is saying to Elijah, don't you see that even if you are alone, you're never alone because I'm with you. 
but you're hiding in fear and despair as if serving me is too hard. What are you doing here? Elijah still didn't get it. He was as dense as we sometimes are. All we can see is how things are affecting us right now. And we forget that we're serving the great Yahweh who has plans and his plans are awesome. We sometimes forget that serving him is never too hard. That don't mean it don't get hard. It is hard. But it's never too hard. <clears throat> Elijah keeps trying to turn the attention back to himself. In verse 14, he said, I have been zealously zealous, very jealous for Yahweh, Elohim of hosts. Because the children of Israel have forgotten your covenant, thrown down your altar, slain your prophets with a sword, and I, even I, only am left, and they seek my life to take it away. You're asking me, what are you doing here? I've already told you what I'm doing here. I was doing a great job of serving you. Everybody else forsook you. Those who didn't forsake, forsake you were killed by those who did forsake you. I'm the only one who hasn't been killed, and they're planning on killing me tomorrow. I'm trying to let you know, Yahweh, that we're in trouble. <laughs> and we really shouldn't laugh at Elijah because we do the same thing. That's right. I'm doing an awesome job serving you. Everybody hates me for it. I'm getting really, it's getting really, really difficult to walk in Torah. And, and I need you to know, sometimes, Father, we're just getting in trouble. And Yahweh wants us to know, nah, I'm never in trouble. And here's a vital lesson to learn from this exchange between Yahweh and Elijah. When we are at our greatest temptation to quit, when we are in our most exhausted state, when we are feeling the greatest despair, if we'll just listen, <coughs> Yahweh will speak. Amen. And sometimes he'll simply say, what are you doing here in this place of despair? I have work that needs to be done. Yahweh had two kings that needed to be anointed. He had a prophet that needed to be anointed. Things that Elijah couldn't do. Looking at wind and earthquakes and fire. And hiding in a cave. <clears throat> Drop down to verse 18. Listen to this amazing thing that Yahweh says to Elijah. <clears throat> Yet I have left me 7,000 in Israel. All the knees which have not bowed unto Baal, and every mouth which has not kissed him. Here is, is the message I heard yesterday, and I'm wanting to convey to you. <coughs> Yahweh has counted you. And he's counting on you. Amen. You know, there was a time when... Yahweh could have answered Elijah and, and might have been able to say to him, I have 3.5 million who have not bowed their knee. Or he might have been able to say at one time, I have 935,000 left who have not bowed the knee. But that number kept dwindling, getting smaller and smaller. But notice this, this is, this is very, very important. Elijah was counting all of those who had forsaken Yahweh. Good. Yahweh keeps counting all of those who didn't. Amen. I have left 7,000 who have not bowed their knee. 7,000. Notice he didn't say, I have 7,000 left who are still reading Torah. I have 7,000 left who are still attending Sabbath services. 
I have 7,000 left who still pray. No, he's talking about people of, of character and determination and strength and courage. He said, I got 7,000 who have not bowed. They were tempted to bow. They were being trying to be forced to bow, but they refused to. I have 7,000 left who have not bowed their knee. You know, every day you and I look around and we see people who will admit that the Messiah's birthday is not December the 25th. They will admit that Santa and reindeer and decorated trees and mistletoe have nothing to do with his birth. But they continue to turn from Torah and turn to these Babylonian religions. We see multitudes of people who we can no longer say of them they're deceived and need to know the truth. That's right. Because we've spoken to them. The problem is not that they are deceived. The problem is now that they are willingly forsaking Torah. Amen. It's a choice. They don't see because they don't want to see and they will persecute anyone who tries to make them see what they don't want to see. We see all of this and we sometimes find ourselves focusing on how many are continuing to forsake Torah and to fight against Torah and, and who are fighting against anyone who dares to promote Torah. But, but today I encourage us Let's take time to be like Yahweh, and instead of focusing on those who have forsaken Torah, <coughs> look around. Amen. Yahweh has counted you. He's not focused on those who are out having, going to be out tonight having a, a Christmas Eve service. He's not focused on those who have forsaken Torah and tomorrow are going to uh, try to celebrate the, the birth of the Messiah on a day that is as pagan as it can be. He's not focused on, he is focused on you. Amen. Yahweh is counting you and counting on you. He knows who you are. He knows what you face. And he wants you to know you're not alone and you're not forgotten. Let's arm ourselves with that knowledge and listen for our next assignment. And our next assignment might not be to call down fire to persuade a multitude to turn back to Torah. Our next assignment might simply be to put your arm around one of your fellow servants and encourage him or encourage her. It might be to send a text, a note, or a gift. But let us learn here today that our duties don't always involve us combating those who are walking in darkness. Amen. Sometimes our greatest assignment from Yahweh requires us to reach out to those who are numbered among the 7,000. They need to be anointed. They need to be prayed for. They need to be... Uh, have our arms put around them. They need our mantles cast upon them. If all we ever do is focus on those who reject what we say, then it will not be long before we're going to feel isolated and want to hide in a cave. But if we'll remember and follow the example of Yahweh and stay focused on those who have not bowed the knee, we'll grow stronger by placing a higher value on relationships that we have with those who do keep Torah. Amen. I'm trying to tell you I love you. Today, tonight, tomorrow, multitudes are going to bow their needs to Baal, to Saturnalia, to Mithra. But we should look around and be couraged. Yahweh has counted his, and we're not alone and we're not forgotten. The other night we were celebrating Hanukkah in our home, and I asked a question. What part of the Hanukkah story recorded in the Maccabees is your favorite or impresses you the most? And then Pepper, at my prompting, Pepper asked Marie that question. She said, Nana, what is your favorite part of the Hanukkah story? And she said, well, the first part. When that wicked king was demanding that everybody forsake Torah, forsake the Sabbath, forsake the feast, and demanding that they eat pork, and everybody was doing as he commanded until he came to one man. When everyone else was giving in and giving up, one man stood up and said, No, I will not. She said, That's my favorite part. Mattathias stayed true to Torah 
though everybody else was forsaking it. That causes me to think of two things in relation to what we're talking about today. When Antiochus began his rampage against Yahweh's people, had you said to Yahweh during that, look, everybody is forsaking you. And turning from your instruction, Yahweh would have said, no, I have Mattathias Amen. and Judas and Simon and Jonathan and Eleazar. No, I have those who will not bow their knee. Amen. He knows who his are. The second thing that comes to mind is Mattathias' attitude when he had to make his stand. Mattathias did not focus on those who were forsaking Torah to do so would have brought him great despair. Yeah. When he left Moden, he simply said, it's recorded in 1 Maccabees 2.27, he simply said in a loud voice, let everybody who is zealous for the law and supports the covenant, follow me. And then he spent the rest of his days focused on those Amen. who went with him. All through the book of Maccabees, we find that he and his son Judas encouraged and encouraged and encouraged those people with words until the point that they defeated nations with that small band. Hallelujah. Well, here's my point. When you decided to no longer bow your knees to man-made religion and give your allegiance to the doctrines of men, Yahweh knew and counted you. He knows you. Now he's counting on you. Not only to face those who oppose him, but to find strength from and give strength to others who are in that number. Don't forget that our task isn't just to go out and contend for the faith. Our task is also to assemble and to encourage and to love, to admire, to respect, and to find strength from one another. I'm not going to fret over all of those who are going to attend church services tonight. or I'm not going to fret over all of those who are proclaiming that this pagan festival has anything to do with our Messiah's birth. I'm not going to fret over all of those who know more about Santa and nothing about Mattathias. I'm not going to fret over those who can name the reindeer but can't name the sons of Mattathias. I, I'm not going to fret over those who decorate trees but don't know nor care what the word Hanukkah even means. I'm not going to fret over those who choose to be vessels for satanic workings instead of hammers for Yahweh. I'm not going to fret over that today. Instead, I'm going to rejoice and be glad over all of those who are not bowing their knee. Amen. Yahweh's focused on you. That's who he's counting and that's who he's counting on. He's not counting those who are forsaking. He's counting those who are returning. Hallelujah. We need to never forget the power of relationship. Keep in mind that when Yeshua would send out his disciples, he would send them out how? Two by two. Thank you. Two by two. They were sent them out alone. <coughs> two by two. And he didn't send them out for long periods of time. They would come back. They would come back to be able to share their stories, to be able to share their disappointments, their victories. They would get further instruction. They would be encouraged. They would be loved on. All right? And this lesson was not just with them when you get to the book of Acts. I think it's around Acts 12, 13, something like that. They're praying. They've met together to worship and they're praying. And the Ruach Kakadesh said, Separate me out, Paul and who? Silas, Silas for the work that I've appointed them. The Rock Cockadash wasn't going to send Paul out by himself. <clears throat> What's your favorite sermon that Silas preached? <laughs> Do you even know of one? Who did he pray for that we, we know of who got healed? 
What great debate did he enter into? <laughs> we don't know anything about him. Other than when the, the Ruach Kakadesh told him to go with Paul, he couldn't be separated from him. <clears throat> there was a reason for him being there. Yep. And that's the reason that after they went on that missionary journey, those who were the enemies of Yahweh said, those who have turned the world upside down have come here too. Those, those two men, Paul and Silas, have turned the world upside down. There is power in relationship. <clears throat> I heard not long ago the story of two Belgian horses that broke a world record. Have you ever been to a mule pool? And they take mules and Belgian horses and things like that and they hook them up to sleds that have just loaded down with weights and, and then the owner of the mule or the horse will uh, instruct them to start pulling. Belgian horses are the strongest pulling horses in the world. A Belgian horse can pull a sled that weighs 4,000 pounds. That's a lot. Talking about a sled, not something on wheels, a sled. But the person telling the story said that when you put two Belgian horses together, harness them together, how much do you think they can pull now? If one can pull 4,000, how much can two pull? 8,000. That's a great guess. And that's what we would think. What would you say? It's more than that. More than that. The power of relationship. That's good. When you put two of them together, it's been recorded they can pull up to 16,000 pounds. <laughs> as remarkable as that is, they found out that if you'll take those two let them sleep together, let them eat together, let them drink together, let them stay in the same pasture together, let them be in the barn together. And then hook them to the sled. Those two can pull 32,000 pounds. The world record is 54,000 pounds. <coughs> And it was set by two brothers. Mm -hmm. They grew up together. They played together. They were with each other all the time. The power of relationship. Man. <clears throat> Elisha needed Elijah. But no more That's right. than Elijah needed Elisha. <clears throat> it's easy for us sometimes to, we get out in the world and we, we focus on how many people are just, they seem to be getting worse and worse. And, and darker and darker and, and more dogmatic in their rebellion against Torah. And it's easy for that to cause despair. Just don't forget sometimes to focus, like Yahweh does, on those who are not forsaking Torah. And understand how valuable what we have is. Yahweh bless you and keep you. Yahweh make His face shine upon you and be gracious to you. Yahweh lift up His countenance upon you and give you peace. His name is put upon you. He shall bless you.